We're going to dig into God's Word here for a little bit. God has uh, done a number of things throughout history, and yet in every generation there are people that struggle with God's role and the surrender to God in their life. And as we see that specifically lived out in community, then that impacts not just individuals, but your local communities and your nation and then our world. And we have been, if you're joining us for the very first time here, whether it be live or online, uh, we have been going through the book of Hebrews, and today we are going to wrap it up. This is the last, uh, I think, anyway, the last uh, message that we're going to have on the book of Hebrews. And I don't know, how many of you remember having to sit down and learn the formal writing skills in some class, whether it be uh, an English class or writing class or maybe a business class, you, you remember having to sit down and write that out and you learned there's block style and then there's a casual style and it, all different ways to do it. And honestly, even though I sat through the class and I passed, I still look it up when I write a formal letter because when you don't do it very often, you kind of forget that that skill. And so uh, I've had to write formal letters here in this last year, and so, but every time, you know, I would think it would stick, but every time I have to kind of just refresh myself to make sure I'm doing it properly. We are going to look at the closing of what we see is kind of a, a regular formal closing as the writer of Hebrews wraps up uh, here in chapter 13. And in chapter 13 specifically, most recently, we have been reading this bullet point list of how the disciples of Jesus were to live out their faith uh, there in that culture in that time period and practice this reality that Jesus was the fulfilled Messiah come that they had been looking for and longing for. Uh, Hebrews was written to a Jewish audience. They had been looking specifically for the Messiah and, well, we know that the Jewish leaders put Christ to death, but that he didn't stay dead, that he was raised to life, and then the news spread throughout the known world about the resurrection of Christ and how he was the fulfilled Messiah. And so these disciples here that the writer of Hebrews is writing to had come to understand Jesus as the Messiah, placed him as their Lord and their Savior, but because of pressures of life and cultural surroundings, they were tempted, they were being pulled away from that life of faith in Christ back into practicing Judaism. And so our writer has systematically gone through, appealed to their background, their, their younger days of teaching, just like maybe some of those songs that you just listened to would have automatically pulled you back to days of yore. They had the same thing as they were reading through this letter that the, was written to them. And each time, each letter, each chapter, we see this constant challenge to trust in Christ as Savior, as Lord, as fulfilled Messiah. No matter what comes, know that what they have been taught is truth, and it's something to hold on to no matter what. And now specifically in chapter 13, we have looked at the wrap-up of because Christ has come, because you've accepted him as Messiah, because you have made this profession of faith and declared to live for him, these are some things to practice. It's not exhaustive, but here's some good things to think about. And so brotherly love, hospitality, obeying your leaders, and specifically the leaders of the church, those of faith. Uh, testing new ideas and making sure that what they are hearing or what they will be hearing, because there will be false teachers that will come and try to share with them new ideas about the scriptures, they already have enough for faith and salvation. It's found in Jesus Christ. And so uh, hold on to that. Uh, do good, be generous and content with what you have, not loving money. But here in this closing statement, he's going to move from telling them how to live a life as a disciple of Jesus, and he begins to make a request of them. And so really he's not telling them what to do, but he is requesting, even though it maybe sounds like he's going to tell them what to do here in these uh, next verses. He's going to request something from them, and the request is that of prayer. 
Now, how many of you just love to bring attention to yourself and ask somebody else to pray for you just all the time? I mean, it, sometimes it's a humbling process to ask for prayer. It, it's a humbling process to ask somebody else to, well, to admit that we don't have power or control over this situation. Uh, we don't want it brought to light. We don't want a big fuss made over things in our life. And so sometimes it's a really major thing when we ask for prayer. But here the writer of Hebrews is going to teach us this importance of inviting others to pray for us. And I'm going to challenge you this, this week to invite somebody to pray for you or with you in something specifically uh, for you specifically of a need or of, of a godly action. Um, this idea of prayer comes if we turn to chapter 13, verse 18. That's where we're going to start reading. And I think this is so, uh, so vital because in the environment of hostility that the Christians were facing in living out their life for Jesus, they, they needed to lift one another up in prayer. And I think in our culture, it's important for us to remind ourselves that whether we're facing hostility or not, to continually invite and encourage one another to lift the body up in prayer. And so this is what it says in verse 18 of chapter 13. It says, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. Now, the pointed emphasis, again, is prayer, but you'll notice it's not for their ailment. It's not for something that they're suffering with in their physical body that we're made aware of, but it is specifically a prayer that they would act honorably in all things. Most of the time, when you or I have a prayer request, it's for a health need. It's a situation that we're dealing with where it's a physical need or even a monetary need. We're in trouble physically. And here, the invitation is not that the writer of Hebrews be, and, and the, those that he's referencing there, pray for us, it's plural, it's not just that they would be delivered from some ailment, but that their actions would be honorable before the Lord. And so in your challenge this week, I, I, it's just when you're asking somebody to pray for you, pray, ask that person to pray that your actions, that your words would be honorable before the Lord. And who knows what you're going to face this week. Uh, I don't know the specific things maybe that you have in mind, a conversation, uh, an environment where you know already it's going to be challenging. It's going to test your faith to be honorable, to speak with integrity, to act with integrity. And so this is the encouragement that you would ask somebody to pray specifically that that environment and your life would be such that it would be honorable to the Lord. Most of the time when we pray, it's, or when we think through the bullet point list of how to live, we think of a, of a checklist of do's and don'ts in life, in Christian life. And I wonder if we stopped looking at the checklist of just do's and don'ts and tried to gauge our life before the Lord with this request, acting honorably, in all things. I know that seems like a little, a lot of gray maybe in your life. <laughs> or you like the check boxes because, well, I've been to church. I've done good. You can check the box. However, even going through the actions and checking the box, has it been done in such a way that it's clearly an action of honor before the Lord? I think in living this way and asking and inviting others to pray for us that we would 
be able to accomplish this, it says, the text, that it would eliminate this conflict of spirit within us. It says their, uh, their conscience is clear. There's this turmoil, this inner turmoil that uh, they do not have because they are living and acting honorably before the Lord. And I think in, in doing this, again, it, it'll lead us to places where, make no mistake, there might be conflict, and it might be external, though, not necessarily internal. Have you ever been in a situation where it's just been hairy? There's no other way to describe it. It's been like tension. You can feel the, the room just building with pressure, and yet even in that moment, you're still acting with honor before the Lord. In Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy, Paul would give this charge. I think this is a good reminder for us as followers of Christ. It's not that we wouldn't have just peace and tranquility, that our conscience is just at complete peace, but there's this uh, verse that says in chapter 1, verse 18, I charge and entrust you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. See that word, warfare? That doesn't, that doesn't, to me, look like, well, tranquility and ultimate peace. But I think in the moment of warfare, your conscience can still be clear. Because you know that you are standing for the biblical precedence that he has taught us in his word. And even though all around you there might be turmoil and pressure, your conscience is clear because your actions are surrendered to God himself. It's so important. Now, he would continue on in verse 19. Paul speaks to Timothy. He says, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck. Of their faith. And so Paul speaks to Timothy this concept that the writer of Hebrews is illustrating uh, to them and writing to them about. It says there is this moment where your conscience will be clear in your actions. It might not necessarily look like complete peace and tranquility. There might be a situation where you have to go and fight for the biblical principles of life that God has presented in his word. And it'll look like turmoil. It'll look like warfare. But when you stand before the Lord, your conscience is clear because you've stood the pressures that are standing against you and you've stood for what God is all about. And this is so, so vital, especially for these believers that he's writing to, these Jewish believers in Christ, they were going to face pressures. They were going to be challenged to go back to the empty practices of Judaism. And yet their conscience in the warfare to stand for the gospel of Christ would be clear. And it would look like warfare in their time period. But before the Lord, it would be an honorable life lived. I don't know about you, but that's, that's what I desire. And I hope that's the same for you. That is the prayer that we, that uh, the writer of Hebrews is asking to pray, uh, to be prayed for them. And so specifically, if you're looking for just what am I asking others to pray for, I'm not going to check up on you. And it's okay if you ask somebody to pray for physical need. But this week, can you humble yourself and ask somebody to pray for you in such a way that even in moments of good warfare, that your conscience would be clear and that as you stand before the Lord, it would be a life lived out that is honorable before him. Peter would challenge uh, the, the readers of his letter there in chapter 2, verse 12. It says, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. So that when they speak against you as evil doers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of, of visitation. Again, this is all just pointing to this idea and concept that we live our lives in such a way that it's first and foremost honorable before the Lord. And as we do that, our culture around us, they just, they don't have any weapons. 
They don't have any way to really attack us. And if they do, they're, they're fairly empty. This is the goal in life that the scriptures are teaching us. Now, a little side note, the original endings here in the language we miss uh, as we read it in English, this, uh, this prayer that he's asking, this conti- it's an action of continuation. Most of the time when you read this, it says, pray for us. It sounds like it's the very first initiation point. But in the original language, the, the endings here help us see that it is a, something that they have already been doing, and the writer is asking them to continue in that. So for us, it might be something that we start doing today, but it's also something important that we continue and that as time continues to go on, we continue this practice so that we can be applying these scriptures. It's a continual thing. Uh, and so the emphasis is prayer. Now, pick someone, uh, pick someone out. Maybe this is a good opportunity for that person that you've been praying for uh, to challenge them in their faith, the, the, our red chair type of person, say, do, do, you, do you believe in, in God? Would you pray for me? It, it can, if you don't know how, or you're not quite sure who it is you're praying to, could we have that conversation? Because I need people praying for me. Might be a good opportunity for them to speak into that and be challenged. Well, am I actually praying to somebody? <laughs> is that person really real? might be a good evangelistic opportunity for you this week. Um, so prayer is so vital, something that we really want to challenge you to this week. And again, it speaks to the intentionality. Uh, if we read this passage that uh, all the more earnestly there in verse 19, uh, other translations say more abundantly, uh, or other uh, writers, commentaries that says beyond measure, So this invitation for prayer all the more earnestly is pray for us more abundantly and beyond measure. So we have the invitation, we have the direction, and now we have the intentionality by which we live this out and we try to practice this. Um, And it's, again, not just a prayer that we'd have more money (laughs) or be able to have just the better, better word or a better health situation but it's that we live in such a way that is honorable before the Lord. This was an expectation. One of my commentators wrote that it was uh, that prevented him from being restored to them is not said uh, as we move on there. Because um, when, we, when we continue on in this text, it says, uh, now let me get to it, that I may be restored to you all the more sooner. I don't know what's keeping the writer from Hebrews from joining with those believers in Christ, but you can see the desire to be with them, the desire for community, which is, again, here as a church. I pray that your desire, when you think about Saturday night, what you're going to do Sunday morning, that it's not like, oh, I have to go to church, (laughs) but that your desire would be to unite and be together just as the writer of Hebrews here is desiring to be restored to them. Uh, It says, that we're not, it, it doesn't speak to what is keeping them from them, but we know something was, and that they believe that prayer would help this happen all the more sooner. Um, so this is, this is just kind of the, the focus point, even just a challenge of community. When we're living a lifestyle that is not honorable for, before the Lord, the last place we want to be is in a place where other people are going to try to hold us accountable to it, isn't it? So again, so vital, this prayer and invitation to act honorably before the Lord so that our desire is to be in community and restored to that community. And if you've been gone for a long time, and if you're listening online and you've been gone for a long time, now's a great time to come back. Your desire, whatever it is that's keeping you from being in attendance here, attendance at the church that you call home, (laughs) Deal with it. Ask somebody to pray. Seek time before the Lord, praying that your life is honorable so that together we can glorify the Lord in worship, in giving, 
in communion and celebration and the family that God has brought together. So important. Now, in, uh, if we continue on, just a few last uh, comments here that he has in wrapping up in verse 20. He says, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, in his final words, he begins to speak of the supremacy of Christ. He's trying to wrap up everything that he's talked about, and he begins to point again the, the, right, the reader's vision back towards Jesus Christ, his position as shepherd. Again, a very Hebrew concept that we don't understand necessarily here in Western culture. And it speaks of Christ's work and establishment of the new covenant, things that we have discussed and he has discussed over and over and over again. And it's, it's really easy to gloss over these characteristics. But first of all, he reminds us that God is a God of peace, that he has done a great work. He has displayed his power over death and over sin. He has been resurrected, something that not everybody believed in that culture, something that they challenged, but it is a core foundational belief to the Christian faith that Jesus Christ is risen. And in doing so, again, he points these Hebrew believers back to Christ and reminds them of the new covenant that they have come to know and understand and reminds them that everything that he's talking about well, you can do these things, but it's God who equips you. Through his spirit, he equips. And many other letters speak of the importance of the equipping of the body of Christ. So this knowledge that you have, this prayer that you're inviting people to pray for you so that you would act honorably is part of the equipping process. Because we don't just come and know more. <laughs> we don't just come and enjoy the space or listen to our kids sing out praise to God, maybe even challenging us in our understanding of God in that moment. But we come so that we are equipped to go and do a work. It's a core foundational belief. Uh, it's a challenge for us. This equipping has a purpose to accomplish his will, the things that they have talked about in weeks past, being bringing joy to God, pleasure to God, joy in his sight. And I think just as we think through this aspect, living honorably before the Lord, inviting people to pray for us, that we would be equipped in this space to go out and, and do his will. There was a, when I was in college, uh, I served as a weekend preacher at a small church and their practice every week in closing was Psalm 19, verse 14. It was the last thing they spoke as a body of Christ together. And as these words, it says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And I don't know if they had translated it from, if at time periods they had practiced the King James Version or not. When I was there, we did the... NIV version, and it went, may, the, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be, what's the word? Pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the aim of the disciple of Christ. This is the aim of the community of Christ. And it doesn't happen without the Lord, and it doesn't happen without community and that invitation of us as disciples inviting others to pray for us, that we would do this. It's a challenge for us. It's humbling for us, but I think it's a, an important element within the body of Christ that sometimes we miss. We might be really good at asking somebody to pray for our ailments, maybe not so great about asking others to pray that our lives would be pleasing in God's sight. If ever there was a checkbox for you to try to achieve to, it would be that. 
but it's really hard at the end of the day to say, pleasing in God's sight, check. Because we really want all the little steps, the instruction manual that would lead up to that, so that when we check each of those little boxes, then we know we've accomplished it. And sometimes we get so caught up in the check boxes that we miss and I think God looks down and says, man, I'm just so frustrated with you <laughs> because you're trying to check the boxes so much and you've missed the whole heart behind it that would really bring me joy and the presentation of the gospel to the world. So what's your aim? Pleasure in God's sight. Now, in verse, just real quick, 22 and following, it says, I appeal to you, brothers, other translations, again, that's a, a gender-neutral brothers and sisters there. Bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written you briefly. It's taken us 21 weeks to get through this. So I will say you can read through it much quicker than that. And if we were to study it you know, continually, we'd, it wouldn't take us that long. It really would feel briefly. And so I want to encourage you this week, go through it. It really will be brief. There's so much more that could probably be said, but he reminds them, bear with my word of exhortation. I've written with you brief, briefly. And then he's going to mention some people. Uh, you know that our brother Timothy has been released, uh, released from prison. I'm not really sure. That's kind of the idea here. Maybe it's released from his responsibility at another church. At, at, at any case, we know that Timothy has been released with whom I shall uh, see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all your saints. Those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with you all. And we don't necessarily know all the people that he's referencing, but we know that God's people is vast. It's not just you and me here in this small circle. It's not just even people in our region who call upon the name of the Lord, but the church is global. And I think it would do us well to pray that the church globally, it, it's important for us to have names, I think, because then we can really interact and hold accountable one another. But I think it's, it brings pleasure to God's sight when we exalt the church together. And pray that the church globally would bring honor to the Lord wherever it's at. And if you want to start, you can start with our missionary list. The people that are overseas, pray for them specifically by name, that they would live a life that is honorable for the Lord and it would lead others to know and seek out the gospel of Christ, the saving salvation that is only available in Jesus, the grace that he's offered us. Grace be with all of you is is a very common term. It's a very common ending to most letters. It's how writers back in the first century finished. We might say sincerely, or if you're even a Christian, you want to spiritualize it in him, right? There's uh, this grace be with you. It speaks and reminds everyone of the resurrection of Christ that was established which established the eternal covenant made possible through Christ. And it's interesting here that we think about grace because that is the, that is the ultimate uh, picture of the new covenant that Christ established, the one of grace. It, it's an adjective here, but again, it points the readers and us to this covenant that can never be replaced even as it fulfilled the old covenant that they were living under. It, it reminds us of the perpetuality of it, the validity of it, established by the blood of Christ. And the author wants them, as the last final word, to remember that grace. And so I said we were going to celebrate a time of communion. Communion is all about remembering the grace that we have been shown. And so if you have your communion packets, what's going to happen is I'm going to say just a few more words here. We're going to give you some time of silence to participate in this. But the grace of Christ is shown to us on the cross. And so the pieces of bread, as you tear off that first layer, that represents his body, which is broken for us. 
Uh, the second layer, as you pull that back, it, it reveals the cup. The, the, the juice inside represents his blood that was shed. As we do this, we uh, proclaim this new covenant establishment, the grace that God has offered to each and every one of us. And as a disciple of Christ, we remember. We take time to remember. And we share in this proclamation. It's not just some empty action that we do each and every week. But it's something that I dearly invite you to, with intentionality, praise God because of the grace and the peace that only Christ can bring. And as you take, may you just think through just this living honorably before the Lord. Because his life was lived in such a way that it was sinless. And because of his sinless life, he and only he is the perfect sacrifice for our sin, which he made on the cross. He died, but most importantly, he was resurrected so that we too might live a new life before him. This is what we remember in communion. This is what we proclaim in communion. So uh, I'm going to pray, and then I invite you to take. Uh, Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for your words that you have shared with us. Thank you for uh, the words of grace and peace made only possible through Jesus Christ. As we taste these emblems, may we be reminded uh, fully of the forgiveness that you have offered us in Jesus, the establishment of the new covenant in Christ. Father, may uh, you be filled with joy as we live our lives before you this week. And uh, Father, challenge us in areas where we have fallen short. Lead us to repentance. And even in a time of repentance, uh, that that action might be done in such a way that it brings honor to your name. And so Lord, uh, together we pray these things in your son Jesus' name.